In this video, we're gonna calculate a nice limit. So we're gonna look at the limit as n goes to infinity of the integral from minus infinity to infinity of sine of 2n plus one over two times x over sine of x over two times x squared plus one dx. We're gonna use two tools in order to make this calculation. The first tool was proven in a previous video, so I'll link that in the description. And that says that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of cosine mx over x squared plus one dx equals pi over e to the m. So that's kind of a nice result on its own. And then the next one is this trigonometric identity involving sine and cosine. So here we've got sines on the left-hand side and cosines on the right-hand side. So we've got sine of 2n plus 1 over 2x over sine of x over 2 equals 1 plus twice this sum. So this is going to be the sum as m goes from 1 to, n to n of cosine mx. So like I said, this was done in a previous video, so we won't repeat that here. Now we're gonna go ahead and prove this second identity. But in order to do that, I'm gonna need a pretty common trig identity that follows from the sum angle formula for sine and the difference angle formula for sine. And that goes like this. Cosine of alpha times sine of beta is equal to one half and then sine of alpha plus beta minus sine of alpha minus beta. So like I said, that follows pretty quickly just from the sum angle formula for sine. So I'll let you guys check that if you want to. So the next thing that I wanna do is maybe take this guy on the right hand side, this one plus two times the sum m goes from one to n of cosine mx, and I'm going to multiply it by sine of x over two. So let's see what that gives us. That's gonna give us sine of x over two plus two, and now we have the sum m goes from one to n of cosine mx and then times sine of x over two. Great. And so notice that's just exactly this right-hand side of our identity multiplied by the denominator on the left-hand side. Now I'll apply our cosine alpha times sine beta identity into the sum and of this. So in other words, I'm gonna take this mx to be equal to alpha, and then this x over two to be equal to beta. So let's see what that gives us. So we're gonna have this sine of x over two out front, and then we'll have two, which is gonna cancel with this one half that comes from repeated applications of this. So that's gonna be plus. Now we have the sum m goes from one to n of, well, what is it gonna be? It's gonna be sine and then the sum of those two. So let's see what the sum of those two are. Giving a common denominator, we have two m plus one over two times x minus the sine of the difference of those two. So similarly, we'll have sine of 2m minus one over two times x. So all of that is within my sum. Then since I have a finite sum there, I can very simply just split that apart into two different sums. So that's gonna give me sine of x over two. That part just comes down. And then I've got this sum as m goes from one to n of sine 2m plus one over two times x minus the sum m goes from one to n of sine 2m minus one over two times x. Great. But what I'd really like to do is combine these in some way. And I can combine these if I re-index carefully. So let's see, I'll re-index this first one so that it looks like the second one. So let's see what that is going to entail. I'm gonna replace m with m minus one. But let's see what effect that has on the parts of the sum. So here, instead of having a two m plus one, I'll have a two m minus one. 
because it's gonna be 2m minus 2 plus 1, so that'll work out. And then here, if m minus 1 equals 1, then m equals 2, so that means I start at 2. And then if m minus 1 is n, then that means I'm going to end at n plus 1. So now let's maybe bring this stuff down. So we've got the sine of x over 2, that's just this term brought straight down. And then let's compare these two. So this first sum after re-indexing, notice it starts at m equals 2 and it ends at m equals n plus 1. So we do not need the n plus first term in there. In fact, we probably need to bring that out of the sum if we want to cancel it with the sum over here. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll bring the n plus first term out. Notice it's the n plus first in the pink indexing. So that's going to give us a sine of 2n plus 1 over 2 times x. And then what's left over from that sum is the sum as m goes from 2 all the way up to n of sine of 2m minus 1 over 2 times x. Again, with the pink re-indexing. So just to reiterate, we took out this term, which was the n plus first term, and then we had all the rest of them in there. Now, notice that we can almost completely cancel this sum that I've written down here with this sum that's on the previous line, except this sum on the previous line has the m equals one term as part of it. So we need to split off that m equals one term as well. Notice if we plug m equals one into this, we're just gonna get sine of x over two. So that's gonna give us a minus sine of x over two because it's attached to a minus. Then what's left over is the sum as m goes from two up to n of sine two m minus one over two times x. Good, and now we're in really good shape. Notice that this sine x over two cancels with this sine of x over 2. And then this big sum from 2 to n cancels with this big sum from 2 to n. And we're left with this thing right here. So notice if we were to compare the extreme left and right hand side of this equation, and then divide everything by sine of x over 2, we would have exactly this identity right here. So that means we've established this identity. And now we're ready to tackle our main goal, which is the limit of this improper integral. So let's maybe go ahead and do that. So here, this is gonna be the limit as n approaches infinity of the integral from minus infinity to infinity of, I'm gonna bring this one over x squared plus one out. So we've got one over x squared plus one. And then I'm gonna take this sine of two n plus one over two x over sine of x over two, which notice that's just the left-hand side of the identity that we just established. And I'm gonna replace it with the right-hand side of the identity that we just established. So I'll have one plus two, and then we have the sum as m goes from one to n of cos mx dx. Great. And now notice we have a finite sum in here. We can always exchange a finite sum with an integral. Notice the limiting stuff is not happening until the end. So let's go ahead and exchange the order of the integration and summation here. So that gives us this limit as n goes to infinity. And then we'll have the integral from minus infinity to infinity of this first term, which is just one over x squared plus one dx plus two times the sum as m goes from one to n of the integral from minus infinity to infinity of cos mx over x squared plus one dx. So all of that is within this summation. And then the bigger object, maybe which I will bracket in yellow, is within the limit. Okay, so that's good. Now what we can do is maybe apply our first tool to each of these integrals. You might say, well, I don't really need to apply it to this integral, but we might as well. We can think of this one as cosine of zero times x. 
because cosine of zero is equal to one, which allows us to use this first tool, although you can do it pretty easily with the inverse tangent function. So let's see what that gives us. That's gonna give us the limit as n approaches infinity. This first one is going to evaluate down to pi over e to the zero, which is just pi. So that's cool. And then we have plus two times the sum as m goes from one to n of now, what are we gonna have here? So we're gonna have pi over e to the m. And again, that's from the tool that we uh, built in the last kind of big integration video that was on the channel. So we've got something like that. Good. And now we notice that this thing right here, maybe this sum that I'm boxing in orange, that is a finite geometric series. And geometric series, finite or infinite, have like standard sums. So let's just go ahead and recall that. That's going to give us this limit as n goes to infinity. We have pi. And then I'm going to factor a pi and an e out of this. So we're going to have 2 pi over e. And then after factoring that stuff out and re-indexing just a little bit, we can rewrite this as the sum as m goes from 0 to n minus 1 of e to the minus 1 to the m power. And I only do that because maybe that's a more standard way to write a geometric series so that we can just write the sum down. So now this stuff that I've written in blue, which is a factored version of this orange box, will sum to one minus e to the minus n over one minus e to the minus one. So there our starting term is one and our common ratio is e to the minus one. So that's why that works. And that's the standard formula for the sum of a finite geometric series. Okay, fantastic. So now what I wanna do is maybe I'll bring a pi out of this whole thing. So let's go ahead and bring a pi out of this entire thing. And then we have the limit as n goes to infinity of one plus. So now we'll have two over e. And then let's see, one minus e to the minus n over one minus e to the minus one. Great. Then it's not too hard to see that as n goes to infinity, e to the minus n is going to trend towards zero. So that leaves us with pi times 1 plus 2 over e. And then we're going to have 1 over 1 minus 1 over e. I just rewrote e to the minus 1 as 1 over e like that. OK, good. Now, let's maybe go ahead and put this together into one nice box. So here we can take this one and we'll maybe write that as e minus one over e minus one. And that's because we can distribute this e onto the denominator here and then it looks like e minus one. So notice we've got e minus one plus two. So that's gonna be e plus one and then we have e minus one in the denominator. So that makes our final answer pi times e plus one over e minus one which I think is a pretty nice result, and that's a good place to stop.